I learned at a, a very young age from my dad, he said, if you want to make money, don't be scared to pay taxes. That said, we have to be smart enough about the tax code to figure out how do we avoid or minimize or mitigate as much of the tax liability as we can. So as a general rule in an IRA, one of its you know, natural functions and best qualities or characteristics is that it, it's tax-free. So, you know, your transactions are exempt from tax. You either pay when you put the money in or you pay when you take it out. But if I have a Roth IRA and I put $100,000 into a house and sell it for 200, I don't owe any tax. And then I take the 200 and buy a house and sell it for 400. I don't owe any tax. So it's a beautiful thing. If I want to go leverage beyond the value of my existing IRA through a non-recourse loan, then I'm going to subject the, the leverage portion to tax. And I want to make sure, you know, everybody's paying close attention to this because this is critical. And when you read stuff on the Internet, sometimes it can portray it to be worse than it is. But I'm going to give you an example of how this tax works. So it's called Unrelated Debt Financed Income Tax, UDFI. It falls under the same code as UBIT, Unrelated Business Income Tax. So it's most commonly called UBIT, even though it actually is not UBIT, it's UDFI because you financed a property. But UBIT for the sake of simplicity and UDFI just doesn't have as, as good of a ring to it. So UBIT it is for the sake of, of discussion. But if I take a $100,000 property and I go out, or I'm sorry, let me just take a, an example of a $200,000 property. So I'm going to call Greg. Greg's got a $200,000 property for me and I'm going to go buy it with my IRA. If I pay cash for it, $200,000 in my IRA, my IRA owns it free and clear and is not subject to UBIT because I didn't leverage it. I rent that property out for a year. Let's say I you know, make a little bit of money, whatever the numbers are, and I sell it two years later for 400. That's $400,000 goes back into my IRA completely tax-free. 200 of that's profit, 200 of that is principal, right? But I just made $200,000 tax-free. That is the beauty of an IRA. Now let's use that same example. I call Greg, Greg has a property, it's 200 grand and I only have 100 grand in my IRA. But I want to do the deal, it's where my money is, I don't want it in the stock market, you know, you get what we've already talked about. I take that $100,000 and I put it down and I take $100,000 from a non-recourse lender, has to be non-recourse to my IRA, and I now own that $200,000 piece of real estate in my IRA. Right? Then there's a mortgage payment that I have to make and I pay that mortgage payment out of the rent. So $900 mortgage payment. Hopefully I'm running it every month for a thousand bucks, right? But I'm, I'm breaking even. At the end of two years, I sell the property for $400,000. Since I paid $200,000 for it, I only have $200,000 of, of profit. So that's all the IRS is going to start with. Of that $200,000, $100,000 of that investment, right, was paid for out of the IRA or 50%. So 50% of that profit goes right back to my IRA tax-free. The other 50% or $100,000, the IRS says you borrowed money, you went outside the IRA to earn this profit. So for that little piece of the profit, we're going to tax you. Even if it is 37%, and there are some ways to mitigate it, but let's call it 37%, you're going to pay $37,000. So what does that mean? It means that you bought a property for, you put a hundred of your own money in, you took out, you basically took out 200. You got to pay the bank back, right? A hundred of that. So the net proceeds back to your IRA are $200,000 of profit, less tax. So you pay them $37,000 off the 200,000 and you just took a hundred thousand dollars from your IRA and made $163,000 after tax. So option A is I invest 200 to make 200. Option B is I invest 100 to make 167. Now ask yourself, right, is that tax scary? Well, one in one case, I make 167%. In the other, I make 100%. And guess which one I made 167% in? The one I paid tax. So people tend to look at taxes and they, and I don't want to say they make bad decisions. And I certainly don't want to suggest that the person that asked the question was thinking about it in a negative manner. It's a fair question and a good one to ask. And I appreciate you doing so. But when you, when you crunch the numbers on these deals and a lot of these non-recourse deals, the tax, because it only applies to the leverage portion of the gain actually doesn't impact your, your return enough to offset the power of leverage because without it, I couldn't have bought it. Here's where I'll take it a step further. 
And am I okay on time? And I guess even if I'm not, I'm just going to go. I love it. Keep rapping, bro. If I take the same 200, right? Put it in for 200, buy it for 200, or sorry, buy 200, make 400. What if I instead bought two with leverage? And now I say, Greg, I don't want one 100, $200,000 property. I'll buy two $200,000 properties. I leverage them both. Results are the same. I, have a, I make $167,000 profit plus my original 100 in each account. And now I have an account that has 200 plus 335,000. I've got about 550 grand off of my 200 investment after tax versus 400 grand off of my $200,000 investment. I could even take it a step further to say that now that I own two properties, I'm diversified. So if one property goes up 200%, one only goes up 50%, right? My average gain is around 110, 20% combined. Whereas if I happen to pick the, the one that only made 20%, not 100%, right? I have no diversity in my investments. So Obviously, I, I love having this discussion because I think it's so powerful. And I don't think you should always consider taking on leverage because I think there's a lot of benefits to buying cash. And But I also think that leverage in an IRA gets such a bad name because of tax, but no one really stops to go, wait a minute, my purchasing power offsets the tax liability in almost all scenarios. That said, I am not your accountant and I certainly won't pretend to be. So make sure that you're crunching the numbers yourself, but hopefully at a high level, that gave you some insight into how taxes aren't scary, right? Greg, you know, one of the first presentations I used to always give, and, and Greg and I have known each other almost 15 years, I would start by asking how many people in the room like to make money, right? Everybody would raise their hand, you know? And yeah. I'd say, how many people like to pay taxes? And nobody would raise their hand. And I'd say, well, then you're a liar because you can't like to make money and not like to pay taxes. They just go hand in hand. And the sooner you accept it as reality, the better off you'll be. I love this. This was this was really great. I, I of course I'm familiar with the the concepts that you're teaching here, but putting real numbers to this is really helpful for folks. And there were a lot of numbers there, but so I'm going to kind of synthesize uh, what I know and what I what I heard here. People really are like when they hear tax or, or they hear about a benefit they may not get in their retirement accounts. It they tend to think that it totally should dissuade them from thinking about investing in their retirement accounts in something like rental properties. When we're talking about it here, we're talking about a specific tax that you may incur if you take leverage on your purchase in a retirement account. Another thing that comes to mind that I hear often is people will say, well, Greg, why would I buy properties in my retirement account if I can't take advantage of depreciation on that, on the asset? And they say, well, you know, I don't get that tax write off. Why does it make sense to buy properties in a retirement account? And I share a, a, a similar message, which is let's change the perspective here, right? The reason why you want a tax write off like depreciation, which you get as a write off when you buy it outside of your retirement account, is because you want to write off an expense against taxable income. When you buy a property in your retirement account, you are already in the zone of not having taxable income, you know, until you, you know, until you uh, need to make a distribution, depending on the type of retirement account. So you're already getting the tax savings that you were hoping to get just by getting that depreciation right off outside of it. But people tend to think, well, geez, just because I don't get depreciation, maybe it doesn't make sense to invest in a retirement account and purchase rental properties or whatnot. So change that perspective is something that I try to do with folks. And the same thing can be said here for, for you, you Ben. I didn't even know the, the UDFI thing. I mean, I'm learning something here too. So we'll call it UBIT, but that's, that's a cool little nugget there. The big thing here is that the same advantages that you get for buying properties in your retirement account, as far as it being tax deferred or tax free, is still that way for the money that's in your retirement account. Right. You haven't, it's not like your entire purchase is somehow subject to this UBIT tax because you leverage on your retirement account. It's just the amount that you borrowed on. So the rest of the benefits that you came to buying rental properties in your retirement accounts are still there for that portion. And I really loved how you broke that down uh, because one little thing, one trigger tax, or maybe one benefit that they didn't get, like the depreciation, and people say, oh, geez. People also say, and I'm sure we, we may get some questions about this for non-recourse financing, the terms for non-recourse financing are not as advantageous as they are for uh, buying properties outside of your retirement accounts because there's a non-recourse component to it. And people say, well, why would it make sense for me to pay a higher interest rate? 
And I said, well, well, geez, let's talk about the big picture here and going through a scenario there where you can talk about a portfolio that might have hundreds of thousands of dollars of additional gains at the end of the day because you took leverage, because you had to pay, maybe even you had to pay UBIT on it. But at the end of the day, we're keeping our minds and our, and our financial goals focused on creating a better outcome years down the road. So appreciate that, brother. That was wonderful.